we've got to see the brain in a much simpler way. We can't see the brain like synapses, neurons, dendrites, axioms. We can't speak in that language because it gives us nothing. But if we're going to be a neural surgeon, that might be quite valuable. But we're, we're not becoming neural surgeons. We're actually becoming neural transformational agents. We want to create transformational change. So our language can't be dendrites, neurons, axioms, and so forth. We can't even talk about the biochemistry. We don't want to really know about serotonin. We don't want to know about cortisol and all those sorts of things. That's a good language if you're in the nutritional space of neurology or you're working more in you know, the chemistry or the biochemistry. We want to get change. We want to talk to today people. So this is understanding why conscious change is rarely permanent. We want to talk a different language. We want to go beyond the consciousness to another space. So the way to think about this, and this is very simplistic, we know about the conscious mind. A lot of people talk about it like the iceberg is a good metaphor. Very small percentage of what we do is conscious. Of course, we know there's a subconscious as well. The subconscious is below the surface, metaphorically, but even deeper is what we're gonna be talking mostly about, which is the unconscious. The unconscious is where the majority of our behaviors live. And that's where we wanna get. It's a little bit like if your body is dehydrated, it sends a signal up to the subconscious where you almost notice that your mouth is dry. But the only way you're gonna change that is by consciously reaching for a drink and choosing to drink it. So just so you understand, the conscious mind is what you consciously are choosing to do but you don't consciously know why you're a left-hander or a right-hander. You don't consciously know whether you, every time you get up from a chair, you put your right foot down before you put your left, or you put your left foot down before you put your right. Or when you fold your arms, do you put your right over your left or your left over your right? Or when you fold your hands together, does your left thumb go over your right thumb? These are things that you don't consciously think about, but there's a program in there that makes sure you do it the same way every time. So what we're aiming to do with this program is get into the unconscious. The subconscious is that phone number that if I put you under hypnosis, you could remember, but right now you can't remember it. The unconscious, I've got to go even deeper to get to that information. So a lot of what we're doing is we're changing behavior to make it permanent. We're gonna change it at the unconscious level. We can change things consciously, but they're often going to be impermanent unless we can keep doing it over and over and over and over and over again. So this is the place that we're gonna be focusing mostly. Now, 95% of all our behaviors are unconscious. The reason I know this is because of this gentleman and many others. This guy is Gerald Zaltman. He's a Harvard professor. He basically was quoted as saying, 95% of thought, emotion, and learning occur in the unconscious mind. That is without our awareness. Sure, it's great to know this, but it's to apply this. And that's where the greatest value is. And the place we want to apply it is at the unconscious. So I want to give you some understandings of behavior here. So the question is why children don't clean up their rooms or do what they're told? There's a really good answer for this. The answer is that from ages zero to seven, we're not even conscious. So we are completely ruled by our unconscious. In other words, never ever say to a child, don't touch, 
the paint. Because our unconscious mind, the only way we can get a negation, which is the word don't, is to actually try it on. So if you tell a child, don't touch the paint, first thing they're going to want to do is go touch the paint. I, I learned this lesson when I was telling my daughter a story one day and she got a little bit upset. And I said, don't cry, sweetie. Guess what? She cried her eyes out. It's a little bit like this. I'm going to say something in a moment and I'm going to get you to try to keep it out of your brain. So I want you to do everything you can with your intelligence, with your power to keep what I'm about to say out of your brain. So I'm going to say some words, but I don't want you to get a picture of it in your head. I don't want you to hear it in your head. I want you to completely reject it. I don't want you to think of a blue tree, not even a green tree. Do not think of a green tree or a blue tree or any tree for that matter. Don't see a eucalypt in your brain or even a fir tree or a pine tree or any tree. Who's got a tree in their brain? So the thing is that the only way you can get rid of the tree is you've got to put it there first. So the thing that we have to understand is how our brains actually work, how they function. So if we look at this little boy and we ask, you know, that's children, you know, that's children. But what's our excuse? The reason that people have problems in their adult life is because from zero to seven, all the data that we heard from our mother, our father, uncles, aunts, teachers, you name it, just went into our brain. So depending upon the people that we mixed with, all of those beliefs went into our brain. So basically, we're all running off neural programs that we installed as a child. This is why adults sometimes act childish. It's because, you know, a tantrum, a fit, an emotional spat is not an intelligent adult function. You know, when you see adults behaving like that, it's because it is the child has now kicked in is let's say you want to succeed in your business or your career. And, and what happened essentially is that you've got a desire, but are fearful about meeting clients. So that's part of your job to succeed. You've got to go out there. You've got to meet clients. So you've got the desire, but you just can't go out there for some reason. And it really doesn't make sense. It does when you understand it from the imprint period from zero to seven. And that's mindset, resources and blocks. They're the things that are going to stop us, you know, our mindset, how we think, what we have and the actual blocks that stop us. So in other words, if your parents taught you not to trust strangers, yet here you are as an adult, you've got to build rapport with strangers it completely conflicts against your program. So the only way that we can get that person to succeed is we're gonna, we're gonna change their beliefs or increase their level of trust or they fail. So in other words, we've got two opposing programs that are working in the same brain. So their boss is saying, go out, meet strangers, make friends with strangers. Mama, dad said, don't trust strangers. So you've got two conflicting beliefs. So these are the, some of the things that we've got to understand. So where that is, is what's called the unconscious. So it makes up about 5% is the conscious, then 95% is unconscious. So the thing that stops us from really t accepting anything that conflicts with our belief system is what's called the critical faculty. So in other words, information will not get past that critical faculty, just like this pen is a cloaking device. So if I press this button and I vanish and disappear, the only way that you'll believe that is if I do it and you see it and it works. 
And that's going to immediately conflict against your belief patterns. So NLP is very much designed to get beyond that critical faculty and go into the brain. There's lots of ways you can do that. I'll be teaching you many techniques to do that. So this is how we think about it. When we're working with people, what we've got to do is we've got to understand that data comes into our senses. When data comes into our senses, one of the first filters that it will hit, like we can see 2 million bits of information every second. So I'm quoting from a guy called Mikhail Csikszentmihalyi, who wrote a book called Flow. So every second, there's 2 million bits of information. We cannot manage 2 million bits of information. So we've got to delete, distort, and generalize information down to about 134 bits. The first filter it's going to hit is our language filter. So when I say, saya mal nasi go rang, if you do not know Indonesian, you won't know I've just asked for fried rice. So if I say good and tak and you don't know German, you don't know that I've just greeted you and I've said good day. So our language filter determines what goes in and what does not. If you cannot understand the language, it's completely deleted. So then what happens is equally there's an attitude filter. So some people have an attitude filter that gets in their way. So for example, if you have in your attitude filter, you do not respect authority. And if somehow you position me as an authority, then it doesn't matter what I say. You're going to go, yeah, right. Yeah, okay. Yeah, okay. Some say that. I don't. So your attitude filter can completely block information and data. Memories filter. This is where we're going to do most of the work. Most of the change work actually is in our memories filter. Our memories filter is pretty much how you were raised, what you were told was true, your, and, and many of the things that you believe about the world are all your experiences. Not all of them are true. Well, they are for you, and they are for me, and they are for all of us but not all of them are gonna serve you. Then we have a decisions filter and our decisions filter is very much governed by many of these other filters. But we, we often have to go through our language filter, our attitudes and our memories before we make a decision. But our decisions filter is one of those filters that a lot of people believe that they make decisions, but a lot of us don't really know what a decision actually is. A decision is not thinking about something. That's not a decision. A decision might come from thinking, but a decision is when you go, right, that's it. I'm doing that. That sounds more like a real decision. But a lot of people get confused. They think thinking is a decision, and it's not. Our meta programs, I'm not going to go into a great deal of detail about our meta programs, other than saying that meta programs are non content filters. Some people need big picture, some people need detail. Some people are people people, some people are project people. Some people need to talk endlessly and don't stop and don't pause and don't have any commas. Other people don't talk much. Some people talk in bullet points. That's right. They give you little bits and pieces. So meta programs are the basic ways in which we function. Our values. Now this, if you, um, you remember the wealth stuff that I spoke of earlier. This is one of the filters that you do most of your work in when you want to help people to increase their income. It's going to come from their values filter. Values is what you think is important and what you think is not important. We unconsciously have a whole list of words that are in our values. And one of the final modules that I'll teach you, I'll teach you how to find 
your actual values. And then there's our beliefs. Our beliefs are black and white. This is right, this is wrong. This works, this doesn't. Most of our problems in getting, many of you spoke about that glass ceiling. The glass ceiling is usually the beliefs. You know, what you believe is possible and equally what you believe is impossible. So all of these filters, we basically see an experience, they go through those filters, we then create an internal representation of what that means. Then we create a, a state, like an emotional state. That becomes our physiology. And then our physiology determines our behavior. So if you want to change behavior, you've got to know which filter you're going to work with. So let me show you this in another way. So basically, those 2 million bits of information, we can't accept 2 million bits of information every second. It would drive us nuts. So we do have to delete, distort, and generalize. But what this also tells you is that everybody is unique because we've all got unique experiences. So we're all going to have unique beliefs and values and meta programs and may have made unique decisions and have classic memories and new ones and different attitudes and different language patterns. So this is what it can also look like. We get this external event. It comes into our brain. And then what happens is all of our filters are going to take bits away. But this is profound. So if you imagine, let's say that what you see at the right of the screen in a moment, there's the data. Let's say that's 2 million bits. It comes into our language filter and it deletes. It comes into our memories filter and it deletes, distorts, generalizes. It comes into our decision filter and it deletes, distorts and generalizes. Then our meta programs go, I only hear the big picture, I don't go into the detail. So it gets rid of even more data. Our values go, this is important, all the rest is nonsense. So it gets rid of that and our beliefs go, I only believe this, I don't believe that. So the data all of a sudden goes from all of that information down to chunks that we can process. Now, here is where it gets exciting. When I first learned this, I thought to myself, because remember, I wanted to become more financial. And remember, I was not in a good financial position when I was learning all this. I wanted to get better at money. So I asked myself the question, what am I not seeing what am I not witnessing in the context of wealth? And that was a game changer for me. So in other words, when Richard Branson walks into a room, he sees something completely different to a homeless person. It's not that any one of them is good or bad. It's just their experiences are different. And what they see is different. Richard Branson sees opportunities. That's why he's a billionaire. A homeless person just sees a bed and a couch or sees being away from their problematic home. And that's why they only see the bed or the couch. So this is how our brain works. These are the filters of our mind. So in other words, there is potential reality all around us. So, you know, we could be anything, we could see anything, we could witness anything, we could create anything, but we don't. What we do is we go into a cave with a torch and that's our reality. Whatever we see, we believe. Whatever we believe, we see. So in other words, once you can start to open your frame, you can see more. So the thing is, it's all about what we see and experience because there is opportunity everywhere, but we're not 
attuned to see the opportunity until we change beliefs, clear our values, get rid of some old memories, those sorts of things. So another way to see this is this here is an optical illusion. If you look at the center of one of those circles, other circles will start shifting. Now, all they are are pixels on a screen. If you saw it printed, it would just be dots on a piece of paper. But in order for an optical illusion to work, your brain must delete, distort, and generalize. It can't see everything at once. In fact, in your eye, what you have is your most powerful rods and cones, which is what translates electrical impulses and data into pictures. The rods and cones in your eye are much stronger in the very center of your pupil than they are at the outside. So it distorts the data. Whatever you're staring at, is going to, you're going to get the most data and detail, but whatever you're not staring at is going to distort. Let me show you another one. So if you look at the cross at the very center, eventually you're going to see a green dot appearing. It might be green, it might be another color for you, but the dot will now start going over the purple dots. And then if you look at it for a bit longer, it will actually, instead of seeing a green dot, it will just erase the purple dots. But all you're seeing is a picture of a number of purple dots. The rest is working as an optical illusion. So if you look at this particular um, set of colors, it will either become a cone coming towards you or away from you or it will start to vibrate and pulse. And the longer you look at it, the more distorted it tends to be. So again, it's an optical illusion. It's your brain working. These could be almonds, you know, but on one side, it's a highlight. On the other side, it's the opposite. It's a dark line. So they're configured in a certain way that they start to distort and they might even look like waves, you know, and they may even start moving. Again, these are almonds, but blue almonds now, but the same principles apply. Some are more narrow, some are wider, but they still have a highlight on one side and a dark spot on another. But they can start looking like rolling waves or even a cylinder. So again, these are all distortions. So basically, again, here are the almonds, you know, but they're in another configuration. They sometimes can start twisting, you know, or moving depending on where you're looking, depending on where the strength of those rods and cones that you present to. But these are all elements that is data going into your eyes your eyes are connected to nerves. The nerve signals are sending signals to your brain. Your brain is now analyzing and drawing conclusions. This is your Homer Simpson filters all working in perfect order. So basically the question is, what is your illusion? Because we are all creating illusions. Now, um, I won't say this to my clients, but I will often say this to my students. Any problem you're having, it remains a problem because you are believing in the illusion. And the longer you believe in the, the illusion, the longer the problem is. Now, if you think of relationship problems, we usually name call in relationship problems. He doesn't listen she doesn't understand he's a this she's a that the moment we name call we are now making the illusion real because we're now given it a name so 
the longer you call that person a bitch, a bastard, an asshole, an ignoramus, a moron, a, a narcissist, a self-centered this or that, the longer they will be that person for you. They're all illusions. They really, really are, but we make them real. We can't stand anything but an illusion. We love reality. The question that your illusions really should, you should be asking yourself is, do your illusions serve you? And do your illusions serve the greater good? And if they serve you and they serve the greater good and your life is great, fantastic. Keep those illusions. So the question is to do we invest in a new illusion? So investing in a useful illusion and your life can, can become quite magical. So my illusion essentially was this. I, I mentioned this earlier to you. I was told by a clairvoyant that I would write a book that was going to change how the world thought. I was also told by someone else that you will learn something and you will master it and you'll take it way beyond where you were taught it. I was also told that you will become well known for what you do. Um, these were forecasts, by the way, from clairvoyance, you know, various different clairvoyants who said a bunch of things. Uh, another one said, you will help many, many, many people all around the world. And this is before I came into NLP or coaching or any of that. And then I also was told that you will be highly supported and put on the universal payroll. And I said, what does that mean? And she said, you will never, ever have to worry about money again. And I went, oh, okay, cool. Of course, I had big money problems then. So these are the things that I was told. Now, my very first coaching session was because I couldn't write a book. I was scared to write a book because I was worried about what my family were going to think when they read my book. Now, I've graduated as a coach in 2002 and graduated in NLP. I did, in fact, all my NLP training in one year. That was the biggest, most changing year of my life. I became a master NLP trainer. I taught life coaches in NLP since 2006. I've had 38,000 hours of transformational work and I've written six best-selling books. This was the very first book that I couldn't write. As I said, it was just a belief. And once I got rid of the belief, I wrote that book. Oh, by the way, not one of my family members have actually even read one of my books. The thing that you're scared of most usually will never, ever, ever happen. So this is how we stop ourselves. Someone says, I want to start a business. I want to start a shop. So what happens is this is how we need to think of change. Like when we're working with our clients, we have to know that they've got patterns. And let's say this guy who wants to start a shop, his pattern is when things get complicated, I procrastinate. Let's say that's a regular pattern for him. He goes to a shop. He sees it. It's perfect. He goes, yes, I want to lease that shop. He gets a lease agreement. He starts reading the lease agreement. It starts getting complicated. He procrastinates. Then he has a memory. The memory is I've never succeeded at any business I've ever started. So I probably won't start a business again. Memories filter can be the block. His belief filter. Most businesses fail anyway. 60% of businesses fail in the first three years. He's, he read that somewhere and he totally believes it. His belief is going to get in his way. Values. I hate my job. I just want to be free of people who always tell me what to do. I want to be free. Here's something I'll share. If you want to be successful in business, don't value freedom. 
because you're going to have to work your butt off in the beginning and forget freedom for the first few years. Then language. If you really want to be successful at business, you've got to know the business language. You've got to know the words of business. But he says, stuff it. I quit. I just procrastinate. I've never started a business before. Who am I kidding? I'll never be free. Starting a shop was a dumb idea anyway. This is how people stop themselves. There are patterns, memories, beliefs, values, language, and of course, decisions that they make, which is I'm, I'm not going to start, you know, and this is where excuses kick in. The lease agreement was too complicated, etc., etc., etc. So what I've been aiming to give you here is how to think when people present problems to you. Where are you going to start? Are you going to start with their pattern? Are you going to start with their memories? Are you going to start with their beliefs, their values or language? But you've got to ask questions to find out where to begin. Be okay if right now you go, Rick, I'm none the wiser. I've got no idea where to begin. That's okay because we're just at the beginning. So what happens is the truth is that you create your own walls, your own blocks, your own limitations in your life. You either invest in your limitations or in a life beyond limits, you know, in getting beyond those limits. So that's essentially how we really stop ourselves. But you will get people who have cynicism. But at the end of the day, cynicism is intellectualism that is cloaked in fear. That's really all it is. So resistance at the end of the day is fear disguised as power. You know, people go, I've got the power, but don't don't try to help me. No, nah, no, nah, I'm going to keep this shitty belief um, because it's more important to me to keep to keep my intellectualism and keep my dignity than it is for me to succeed. And you'll hear this. People will tell you that, you know, in roundabout ways. So at the end of the day, what we're aiming to do in this training is really to open our minds and start to really get curious, really start to think, how can I get myself to where I want to be? Where do I begin? So the way to begin is be courageous and be open to change by opening up your mind rather than closing it down. And we don't want to be too decisive yet. We don't want to shut down our options. We want to open up our mind and go, Ooh, I'm curious now. How do we, how do we create this change? Because from here onwards, you've got to be vulnerable enough to change the things that you can. And of course, the things that you must change. That is if it doesn't serve you. Don't chance it change it. If it doesn't work, change it. So